I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, we have real two topics that are really interesting. One is um, fall migrants. And the other one is like, kind of wonder, like they could probably use this topic. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. We're excited to have uh, Mr. Michael Ammerman with us. Uh, Michael is a part of our team here and he's going to be talking about geographic information systems and what that GIS means and how we kind of use it. it. I think you all get a lot out of it. Uh, Mike has some um, expertise in that for sure. And then we do have Dr. McNeil on talking about migratory birds and the fall migration. And yes, Renee, I think they could play nicely together. They probably uh, have an internal GIS yeah. system. <laughs> You know, I, I want to tell our audience real quick, we had such a wonderful day yesterday. A bunch of us from our um, Forestry Extension team and many other partners were down in Breathitt County at Quicksand at the Robinson Center, UK Robinson Center at the Wood Utilization Center for our annual Win with Wood event. So mm -hmm. I think, Renee, what, we have 12 different schools or groups right. there and a, a couple, uh, almost a couple hundred kids and just a lot of partners. But just a big shout out to all of those Um people that were engaged in that event it was a good um, very good event so i uh, just wanted to kind of acknowledge that for them um, mm -hmm. but thank them for being there and being part of it the yeah. youth look good i was proud of them they really did they yeah. really did so um let's go ahead and get started with today's show and michael if you want to turn your camera on hey good morning Thanks. good morning how is everyone today doing hey. well doing well so glad to have you on here well, I'm glad I'm, I'm I'm appreciative of the opportunity to be on and I just wanted to thank you all for having me on here and give me a chance to kind of share some of what I do. Yeah. I noticed so. you know at the last time you were on we were you were talking about the Kentucky Wood Expo and something that you were doing and ironically um we had a gentleman that popped in you know when we I was riding around at the Wood Expo and he was like do you have anyone else who could do something on GIS and I was like Michael, <laughs> you know, so ironically, I learned that we had someone who wanted this topic at the expo, that something that you had done, and now you're doing it again. So we greatly appreciate that. Well, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I'm just happy to get, happy to show everybody kind of this stuff, some of this technology, what they can do with it. And I'm going to try and make this kind of, today we're going to kind of go over kind of an introductory part of it, where I'm just kind of giving you kind of the basis mm -hmm. of what, of kind of how to build up what we're doing, what you will do, and you can do professionally or, you know, leisurely for GIS slash cartography. So uh, if it's okay with everyone, I can go ahead. It's okay. Yeah, get started. Start. Yeah, we might have to have you on later, Michael, to get part two and three as we go. Oh, on. yeah. This uh, is I'm looking forward serious. to it. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So today we're going to kind of start, like I said, with a basic GIS introduction on how this works, what it is, what we do with it, why we use it. So for From the Woods today, I'm going to kind of start off by introducing myself as to kind of how I got into GIS and things like that. So my name is Michael Ehrman. Um, I have an Associates of Science and Computer and Information Systems from Hazard Community and Technical College. Um, I have a Bachelor's of Science in Forestry with a minor in Mapping and GIS at the University of Kentucky. I'm um, currently in the progress of working on my master's in science in digital mapping, which is a kind of expanded version of GIS that involves web programming and um, layer-based programming, as well as system-based programming. Um, so I am a former GIS technician when I was on campus that I worked for um, Facilities Information Services. I did a lot of GIS work on and around campus, and I was really passionate about it. Um, I also, once I graduated with my um, Bachelor's of Science in Forestry, I went and taught computer science um, at Lee County High School for a couple of years where I taught programming languages such as Python, Java, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, PHP, and a realm of other different languages. Uh, I'm currently a UK Forestry Extension Associate. And kind of the area that I kind of focus on is um, timber harvesting. What we have here is we have what is GIS and what is cartography? So when it comes down to it, people kind of assume that GIS and cartography are one and the same. And that's not exactly true, but it kind of is at the same at the same time. So when we say that, they are different, but they also go hand in hand pretty well. So a geographic information system is a system that creates, manages, analyzes all types of data. So when we do that, essentially what we're doing is we're trying to map spatial phenomenon with the globe with the earth and we can kind of use that to kind of to kind of put data and 
a visual representation of the world around us without necessarily having to write it. Because like they say, right, especially when it comes to cartography is the study of designing and drawing maps. So essentially what you're doing with cartography is you're taking those principles of trying to figure out our world around us and put it in a visual kind of representation. The study behind that is cartography. So the GIS is kind of creating it, developing it, and getting that data together. And then you use the cartography side of it to actually design and draw those maps. So there's some people that have certain categories within this subset where they mainly just focus on cartography. They take data or GIS data that other people have used and convert that into maps. And it's kind of a pretty interesting topic there, right? And they say that, and the thing that's nice about pictures is you can kind of see a picture and it's expressed in all different languages and things like that. Anybody, whether you speak English, Spanish, German, Portuguese, etc., you see, you can see a visual representation of those maps and kind of know what's going on there without necessarily having to be able to read the language it's written. So like, so as they say, that's kind of a great way to look at how we're visualizing this thing, right? So first off, we need to kind of talk about some of the software that's used for developing um, GIS data. So what we have is we have really two main players. There's some smaller players that use it, but the two main ones for this are ArcPro and QGIS. So what's the difference from that? So with QGIS, um, we need to first figure out what is FOSS. So that's kind of a term we use within our kind of the realm of GIS, and that's a free and open source software. So with that, when we have a free and open source software, that is when contributors are developing products that are free for the user to use, right? So for QGIS, a FOSS serves some powerful capabilities, but it's catalog for GIS processing extremely limited when compared to Arc Pro, which we'll get into that a little bit here in a second. But the main thing about QGIS is we want to remember that it's free and it's open to everyone. And it's really good for someone that's kind of just starting out in cartography or GIS that wants to kind of master these skills. It's still a very powerful tool, but when it comes down to it, we also have Arc Pro, which is a paid subscription. Now they have some sub subscription services from um, $100 for you know individuals and people looking to just kind of feet wet with it or to um, people that are just graduating from college and are, you know, in the realm of GIS and want to kind of continue that, want to kind of continue working with maps, and that's a cheap option for them. But then you get to the advanced pro license for businesses, which can cost up to $4,100 and some change um, for a yearly license. So, but now um, I kind of want to put you all on a little secret here. Um, that's kind of why the, the emoji was supposed to kind of be a shush emoji, like kind of like, you know, keep it on the down low. But um, it doesn't really look that way. It's kind of not as not as perfect as I had hoped it would look. But uh, so I'm going to talk kind of about like a MOOC license. So what that is with Arc Pro is it's kind of a way to where Esri puts out these, Esri, which is the company that develops Arc Pro. I should have mentioned that. I apologize. So Esri puts out these trainings that people can do for Arc Pro. They have these MMOC licenses here. And what it is, is essentially training courses that Esri puts together that people can use. Like you see here, we have spatial data science, new frontier. And if you're actually interested in doing this, these trainings are excellent, by the way. They're excellent. So here we can see registration as opposed to this one. But when you register for these classes, they give you a free ArcGIS license to use in these courses, which you can also use for your kind of it's still an active license, so you can use it for your various other tasks that you would use with it, that you would do with GIS. So, like, we also have one here you can sign up for, which is imagery in action. So, you can see here, you can come here and register. You want to create an account. It's a free account. Register. It gives you license. It gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to perform imagery in action things, such as, like, it'll have you deal with some rasters and things like that, which we'll get into more here in a second. So, the next part is... We kind of need to talk about some vectors and rasters. So these are your two main data types, essentially, within GIS. So a vector is made up of points, lines, and polygons. So as we can see here, this picture on the right is we have individual X, Y locations. And as you get to lines, we have composed of many, at least two vertices or points that are connected. So, right? so in GIS, we either call them a vertice, node, or point. And what they do is they create line segments. So you can have your points that just show a geographic location versus your lines, versus your polygons, right? And your polygons are something that has three or more vertices that are connected and closed. So you just got to remember that you're building these layers here from points and then into lines and into polygons, but you can also keep them just as points, lines, and polygons individually. But you have to you have to stack, you have to start with points, and then your points turn into lines, and then your lines turn into polygons. 
And I'll kind of show you all how some of that works here. All right, so when we do that, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start with um, what's going on with QGIS. So I started up QGIS here, I'm sorry to blank, a blank template. All right, so we kind of want to analyze what's going on in the world. So we have here, one good way to do this is, they, is Google and as we put out these standard XY tiles, and they're kind of easy to use. So right here, we can add this tile here that shows the satellite image. So with this satellite image, we can actually go to online and kind of type in and search for these. So we come in here and I can type in Google X satellite XY tiles, right? So here we can see we can see URLs that show some of these maps. So we have a roadmap here that uses this XYZ tiles to create a kind of a raster image, right? So as we get to that, we can come in here in the QGIS and I can come here and I can make a new connection. I can we can make the name roadmap. And then we can add that URL that's there for it, and we'll hit OK. We've added our roadmap there. Now I'm going to turn off this layer, and we'll add the roadmap layer to it. And you can see now that we have a roadmap layer that we can use to see some of the road data that we want or things like that that we can kind of navigate through. Now what I want to do, though, is I have actually created this morning, I created a layer. And here's how we're going to add layers. So to add a layer, you go into layers and then add layers and we can go to a vector layer we can come in here into vector and right here you can see this i have that and we have i put in the documents folder today a location of quicksand so whenever you're adding a shape file to qjs you want to click the one that says dot shape whenever you download a shape file i'm going to show you all how to download shape files here in a moment but for right now i'm just going to get this on here so we can kind of zoom to it. Now, when I zoom to this layer that I had created this morning, I'm going to zoom to layers, and then we can see here we have, so we can see here we have the location of the wood utilization center. Now, I kind of want to see where this is in relevance to the world if we're in the state. So what I can do is I'm going to come back to Google here. I'm going to go to the Census Bureau. I'm going to download a U.S. County shape file. Come in here. And download our county shape file and I'm going to use the county um, US county 500k.zip and then it's in our downloads folder I'm going to go ahead and unstrip and extract this so whenever you download these zip files you want to extract them into a folder you can remember because then you're not going to be able to access them if you don't get them out of this compressed zip folder so we're going to go ahead and we're going to extract all here and then Hopefully you can still see the screen where I'm browsing to it. I will browse to my From the Woods today and we'll extract it into this folder. Now, when I come into QGIS, I'm going to add this vector layer. And now, once this transcribes, we should be able to zoom out and see that it covers the United States now where it once was, right? So we can see as we turn this off, it's almost a perfect representation of the United States. You can even have it down here to Hawaii, right? So this was kind of the first moment I realized GIS was pretty cool because it shows that all this geographic information, even though you take it from different data sources, you can see that it all relates to certain projections. Now projections, we can talk about that for, for two years if we want, because there's people that spend their whole life studying projections. So essentially what a projection is though, is think of it like trying to take an orange and trying to peel those layers off of that orange and then trying to make it flat and into a almost rectangular picture. It's really difficult to do. So there are entire groups of people, entire groups of cartographers and GIS professionals that are dedicated to solely trying to figure out ways to mitigate these kind of problems that happen. So what happens when you do a projection, though, is you distort a land area, you either distort land area or the shape. And this right here is a Mercator projection, as we're looking at, that most people are familiar with. And as you can see here, Greenland is the same size as Africa, as it looks in this one. But in reality, Greenland is actually one-eighth the size of Africa. So we, so we can see here how these, as you get closer to the poles, that we have to distort that area to create, to keep the shapes kind of the same. Or you have to either distort shape to keep the area the same. So projections are very important to kind of know about as you get into more GIS data. So now we want to just get the Kentucky level off of this. So we know if we go in here into the 
attribute table, we can see the name of our state. So we know that. So the state FP is 21. So if I come in here and I click on, sorry, having a difficult time seeing this with it blocking my thing. We have what's known as the information tab. We hit this and it gives us the information. So now our state FP is 21. So we can come in here and filter it. And we can do state FP, which actually I don't, hopefully everyone can say we can do state FP equals, and we'll do sample, we'll do 21. And now when I run this, we should just get Kentucky out of that. So we have all our Kentucky level layers there. And now I want to be able to see where my quicksand location is so I can drag this on top of it. And now, as you see, we can see the quicksand location there in Breathitt County. And since I also still want to be able to have my counties there, I'm going to actually turn this into a transparent layer so that way only the outline will show. So you can come in there. So we're going to make this a transparent layer. So now we can see that we have this kind of effect here that shows us in transparency. So when I zoom in, we can still see what's kind of going on in the background here, which actually I'm not a huge fan of this. So I'm probably just going to change it to a simple field and we'll just do that. And now we can still see our county outlines but we can see straight through them. And now I kind of want to show you all how to represent some GIS data with that kind of relates somewhat to forestry. So we have some patches of trees here. We're going to go ahead and we're going to create a layer. I'm going to call it a new shapefile layer because that's a vector layer that we're going to want to use. So we're going to name this. We will name it, let's name it trees real quick. And then we're going to give it a geometry type of point. And then we're going to want to put this on Kentucky State Plain for our projection. So we're going to do that with the feet US, and then we're going to add a couple fields to it. So one, I'm going to add DBH, and we're going to make that a integer, which is a whole number. And then we're going to add that field to the list. And then now we're going to make a string, and we're going to call it species. We're going to make, we'll make that link 80. So that's our maximum we can do. We'll add that to it. We're going to create this layer. So now we have trees, and now I want to add data to that. So now I'm arbitrarily going to pick one of these trees here, and we're going to call this one. We're going to say we're going to call this one's ID one, and I'm not exactly sure what this tree is or what its DBH is, so I'm going to make an arbitrary DBH. So we're going to have 25. We'll DBH 25. We'll do. Um, we'll just call it a white oak. Then we're going to add another point, and we can add another point here. Not sure what it is, but I'm going to call it. We're just going to arbitrarily pick another DBH, and we'll call it like 14. Then we'll do our species and we'll call it, let's call it red oak. And now I have represented on this map these trees in this location. And I'm going to go ahead and save this data. And now if I want to show these by their DBH size, I can come into properties and go into symbology. And we can do a, we will do a categorized here, make the value of DBH and then we'll classify it. And then now we can see that we have very based on our DBH, we can see various colors for what our DBH is. So we can see here on the left side that we have our this DBH 25, we'll see it as red, it's DBH 14, we'll see it as 14. And now one last thing I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you all how to draw polygons to get the area of this cornfield here. So what we want to do is we're going to come here into layers and create a layer. I'm going to do a new shape file layer. And we're going to call it, uh, we'll just call it field, the geometry type um, polygon. We will give it a representation Kentucky single zone. Um, and we'll just, we don't need any name fields for that one. So we'll just do that. And I'm also going to change my CRS projection to Kentucky single zone. So that way we get the correct application for it. So I'm going to go ahead and start drawing this polygon real quick. So now let's say I want to get the area of this. I want to know what the size of this field is. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to quit edits. I'm going to save them. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to go to the attribute table. I'm going to do what's called field calculator here. And we're going to create a new field. We're going to call it size. We're going to make it a decimal number. And we're going to come in here into geometry. And we're going to use area. So this should generate the area of that polygon. 
We know this is in, this is in square meters, so we want it in acres. So I have here the conversion for acres from square meters. So for the conversion is, um, you're supposed to divide by 4047. So we're going to come in here into and create another field calculator. I'm going to call this one area acres. We're going to make that a decimal number. And so we're going to take the size and we're going to divide it by 4047. And now we get, okay. So now we see that the size of this polygon we created is about five and a half acres. So now that is kind of a short gist of how GIS kind of works. Yeah, that's just kind of a, what I wanted to show you all. And I appreciated you all having me on here to kind of show how we can show some of this data and incorporate GIS into the free and allow, you know, the, the common person that doesn't might not have GIS background, but has the ability to play with it and see it and kind of use it. And I just appreciate your all's time. Oh, I, I liked it. You, you know, Michael, I'm sitting there thinking, all right, I'm going to download this QGIS. I want to go play with it too. And you made it approachable. The great thing about this is this is recorded. So if folks are kind of wanting to follow along with you, they can kind of go back and watch your recording as they're working on it as well. So um, I really appreciate you putting this content together for our audience and um, I, I look forward to hearing some next ones. There was a question about is there a way to maybe incorporate property lines into this? You know, I, I'm assuming it'd be like a, a parcel of, of landowners parcels, their property lines. Oh, well, there kind of is. I think your local PVA offices have some of this data available. And there's ways to where if you have like a county level P, PVA, you can do what's known as georeferencing. Maybe in another, in another segment, I can kind of show how you can georeference some of these property lines based on actual data. Because... Essentially, I didn't get into rasters this time very much, but what a raster is, it's kind of made up of, instead of being points, lines, and polygons, it's made up of what's known as pixels. Even your standard um, JPEG, PNG file, things like that are all rasters. They just don't have a geographic value. And what you do with georeferencing is you can take those pictures and use some of the you know georeference and give it control points that will give it a geographic value. So yes, it is possible to do that. And maybe in a further, in a future topic, we can do something like that. Okay. Yeah, I think there'd be some interest in that for sure. Um, yeah, there's just so it's so cool. It's I mean, it's so powerful. These maps and being able to drill down and kind of see what's happening. It, it's just it's really interesting, Michael. Thank you so much. And I love that we're recording this. So that way it can go step by step. You know, if somebody, you know, needs to pause Michael and and see what they're doing, they can do that. You know, so we'll have this recording up in about a week. So just so you, so if you all want to. But thank you, Michael. We greatly appreciate that. Yeah, we'll have you back, sir. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to it. All right. All well, right. Let, let's talk about kind of big areas now, Renee. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, the fall migrants, birds that are migrating from one location to another, probably wishes they had that GPS, but they have something already built in. So um, uh, Dr. McNeil is going to be talking about that um, and kind of the fall birds that are that are migrating to different areas. Yeah, we appreciate him putting this together and um, I'll go ahead and get it rolling, Renee. Okay, folks, welcome to another Bird of the Month. <clears throat> this month, we're going to discuss migratory birds, in particular, the migratory birds that we're going to see uh, in and around uh, Kentucky. We'll also start uh, by talking a little bit about what migration is, how it works, how birds are prompted to begin migration, and a little bit about uh, general migration ecology. So without further ado, let's dive right in. So. When thinking about where birds could occur, uh, it's helpful to think about a range map. So here's a range map uh, taken from the eBird website for the wood thrush. Now this kind of uh, reddish area is where the wood thrush breeds. This blue area is where the wood thrush winters. And these yellow areas are regions where wood thrush can be found during migration. In this case, uh, fall and spring migration. So generally we think of the migration route as the sort of in-between area between wintering and breeding grounds. And that is for uh, basically the habitats where species could be found during that time. So the wood thrush provides us a nice example. It's a very widespread species. Take a look at this yellow area here along the Gulf Coast. The wood thrush is really only found along the Gulf Coast during migration. Uh, we can look at another example. This is the chestnut-sided warbler, really lovely uh, neotropical migrant. So they breed throughout the kind of upper Midwest and lower boreal uh, region and down through the Appalachians. This is the red breeding area. Uh, they winter throughout mostly Central America, a little bit of the Southern uh, United States. Um, and you can see that there's a large swath 
uh, where the species is found during migration. Now, <clears throat> migratory uh, uh, behavior is usually a bit more complicated than just the birds breed here, they move there during the winter, uh, <clears throat> and the migratory route is the whole area in between. It's, it's usually a bit more complicated than that birds don't migrate south or north in one single movement what they usually do is they make small jumps and then take breaks between those jumps. So those little breaks are called stopover locations. And those provide birds like this lovely Swainson's thrush here, a chance to rest during their migration and refuel. So eating fruit or insects, things like that to fuel their, uh, in the, as the case may be here, southward migration. So this is an example from Del Luca et al. 2019. It's a scientific paper <clears throat> and I've kind of uh, uh, removed some of the details just to simplify things a little bit here. But what these researchers did is they put these teeny little tracking tags on black pole warblers that were captured throughout the boreal forest and uh, you can see these, these arcing movements are where the birds traveled. So this is the capture location, the circle, and these triangles here and here are the individual birds, which are of course color-coded, uh, stopover locations. So for instance, this purple bird moved south and then it kind of traveled along the uh, uh, Atlantic coast here, flew across, uh, hit Venezuela, uh, moved along the coast of Northern South America a little bit before it finally went into Northern Brazil where its uh, wintering territory was. So these stopover sites, these triangles, are where birds are refueling and resting. Now, the black pole warbler may not be the best example of this because they migrate really huge distances in one go. Birds may jump only a few counties in a night, um, and, and it could be a rather slow migration. Some birds take several months to migrate south. There are also species with a facultative or a partial migration, so that, that they migrate in some parts of their range, but not others, or the population may shift around a little bit, but the general occurrence patterns remain mostly static. A good example of this would be blue jays. So this is the distribution of the blue jay. In this case, the year-round distribution is shown in green, and this this blue area is winter only. So this area here through central Texas is an area that only sees blue jays in the winter. So it demonstrates that they have some migratory tendencies, but they may not uh, um, appear to migrate out of most of their, their distribution. So you may be wondering what, what cues do birds use to, to initiate migration? Because migration is a is a big deal and, and many birds, <clears throat> songbirds for example, are migrating uh, south for the first time in their lives, never having been shown how to do it. And as we'll discuss, many birds aren't actually taught how to migrate, they just do it naturally. One way that birds orient to, to head south in, in the fall or north in the spring is the use of the stars. So the, a variety of studies have shown birds using the stars to orient on their migration. Now it's important to remember that for a lot of songbirds, like our friend the black pole warbler or the Swainson's thrush, migration is a nocturnal behavior. So that's why you don't go outside and just see a lot of songbirds migrating. It's because this happens at night. And we've talked about this on From the Woods Today before. Um, you can go out at nighttime. This time of year is a great time to do this. Uh, especially right after dark or right before sunrise, and you'll hear birds calling in the dark. Um, and these are birds that are migrating, in our case south for the winter. A great example of how researchers determined that birds use the stars as a cue to migrate is with these, these tools called an emlin funnel. And emlin took birds like indigo buntings and he put them into the bottom of this funnel. So here's a side view and then here's a top view. And they put them in this funnel, and at the bottom is an ink pad, and on the sides of the funnel are white paper. And the top is screened in so the bird can see out through the top, but they can't actually get out. So what happens is the bird, let's say it wants to go that way, it scrambles up, flapping and, and scrambling to try and get out. It hits the screen and slides back down. But because it was standing on this ink pad, it leaves footprints as to where it was trying to go, 
And throughout the course of a night, you can get a pattern as to where the bird wants to orient. Well, what Emlyn did and other people have done since then is put these birds outside and try this. Here's the North Star, and you can see that the birds are mostly orienting in a northerly direction. What you can do, however, is put the birds in a planetarium and orient the North Star correctly, and they behave normal. But if you flip the North Star around, the bird can be tricked into uh, trying to migrate south, even though it should be going north. They're tricked because the planetarium is convincing them they're facing the other way. Now that's just one really cool example. Um, a lot of long-lived species, uh, especially social birds, use landmarks. Um, those are usually very intelligent species like geese. Um, and this is taught frequently uh, what we call vertically, so from parent to offspring, as is the case with like geese and swans or other species uh, can be taught by unrelated uh, members of their species. Uh, we call that horizontal transmission of information. So that would be like crows, for example. They, they follow other crows and, and actually that's one of the few um, passerine birds we see that migrates during the day. Of course, there's also genetics. Um, songbirds, as we've discussed, usually don't migrate with their parents. They're usually migrating solo in the dead of night. <clears throat> Once in a while, they'll be flocked up with a couple others of their species, uh, but it's usually a solitary endeavor. And a, a recent uh, couple of studies have looked at this with Swainson's thrush, for example, which we'll talk about several times today. And what they did is they looked at the genetics of migration. They found that some birds had a genetic predisposition to migrate through the interior of the United States and potentially across the Gulf of Mexico. Other birds tended to stay to the west coast uh, and migrate south that way. So that's all well and good, and they found that that was genetically determined. Well, the really cool thing is they looked at birds that had a hybrid genotype. So bird that was a, a mix between a mom that was this and a dad that was this, and they found that those birds, these orange lines, tended to travel up the middle, showing that it's, it's very much a genetically predetermined behavior that, that these birds uh, engage in. Of course, there are also eruptive species, as they're called. So uh, a good example of that would be the common red pole, which is a, a northerly uh, finch species. And this is their distribution here. You can see they breed uh, basically around the Arctic Circle or very close to it. Um, but in the winter time, they can winter throughout much of the boreal forest. But occasionally, they extend into the Great Lakes and, and western United States. And some years yet, they also go even further south, occasionally even getting down into Kentucky. And a good examples of this would be red-breasted nuthatch, common red pole, and many other of these more northerly species. And it's usually this behavior driven by crop, uh, seed crops in the northern boreal forest. But a key component of understanding eruptive birds is that they, they have a range where they're occasionally common and sometimes totally absent. So like some years we'll have, like last year's a great example, we had plenty of red-breasted nuthatches here in Kentucky. Um, who knows if we'll have them this year, but it, it varies by year whether they're found here in high numbers. Okay, so that's a little bit about uh, migration ecology in, in eastern uh, migratory birds. But let's dive into some common species that you might expect to see here in Kentucky and how to identify them. I would say that one group of, of migratory birds that we see pretty commonly here in Kentucky are these kind of brown forest thrushes. And there's a, a number of them. We're going to only talk about a few of them here. Um, one of them is the Swainson's thrush. We've already talked about this bird a bunch today. It's not much to write home about. Um, kind of this, these little uh, black or, or I guess dark brown spots on the breast that kind of fade into a smudginess. It's got kind of this cool brown back and, and head that kind of can look greenish on some birds. The diagnostic feature, however, is this buffy pair of spectacles here around the eyes. It looks like it's wearing buffy uh, 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 glasses, if you will. Now, during the breeding season, they have a very beautiful song. I can play that for you here. But you're not likely to hear that much in migration. Mostly what we hear are these, these peep calls that they do while migrating. Another brown forest thrush that's quite common is the hermit thrush. So the hermit thrush, these thrushes are a little tricky. It looks a lot like the Swainson's thrush, but notice that it does not have the buffy spectacles. 
And the other key is that when you look at the back, it's got this very reddish tail, makes it very distinctive and uh, much more straightforward to identify than, than a lot of other groups of birds. So that the, couple of diagnostic features on them. It's another one that has a very beautiful song, all the thrushes do. Um, here's the Swain, or the hermit thrush song. But we're not likely to hear that during migration. More likely, we're gonna hear vocalizations that sound more like these. And the last of the brown forest thrushes we're going to discuss, uh, as you can see, is the wood thrush. Uh, some have said that the wood thrush has the most beautiful bird song of all eastern North American birds. But again, we're not going to hear that beautiful song until springtime, which sounds like this. Usually during fall migration, we're going to hear e either these series of pop, 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 pip, 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 these very snappy notes that they do usually uh, very early in the morning or very late at night. The next bird that's worth discussing, uh, very common here in Kentucky during fall migration, and of course it breeds here too, is the gray catbird. So the gray catbird is a really interesting species. It's what we call a mimid. Um, so they learn to uh, uh, imitate the sounds of other birds as a means of attracting a mate, but they don't do that song much during the fall Mostly what this bird is doing is, is either these sort of these ratchet calls, as they're called, or the namesake cat-like meows. Next up, we have to talk about the American Robin. I feel like we talk about the Robin on almost every single episode of From the Woods Today, Bird of the Month. Um, the American Robin is another species, very abundant in migration, and it's actually a thrush. Um, it's just not particularly brown. Um, but it's worth looking at a few of the different plumages that we see from American Robins. This is an adult male. We've got that very kind of re reddish orange uh, breast and belly, dark head with white markings around the eyes, and this gray back. But we also have a, for instance, young female, juvenile females that may be very pale above and very pale below and have almost more intricate markings on the face. This would be a young female most likely. And occasionally you'll still see some juveniles. So this bird is still got a lot of its, uh, the spotting that you see on juvenile American robins and it's just starting to get those reddish feathers uh, that uh, the species is so well known for. We won't, we won't hear much of the namesake, uh, uh, or excuse me, some of the classic songs of the American robin uh, in the fall time. More likely you'll hear uh, the whinny calls or various other calls like these. Of course, uh, for me, when I think about fall and migrant birds, one major group that comes to mind are the blackbirds. And they, they have a variety of vocalizations, uh, but, but we don't need to get into them here because a lot of them do sound quite similar this time of year. They're making a, a cluck note, most of them. But visually, they're very distinctive. So this bird here, this is the common grackle. Male and female are fairly similar. Uh, distinctive, we've got this kind of bronzy iridescent body, this kind of purplish head, and this very light colored eye. And it's a quite, quite a large bird. It's one of the larger birds you're likely to see at your feeder. And it's got a very long bill, very long and, and pointed bill. Many people who feed wild birds aren't particularly fond of grackles because they, they eat a lot of bird feed. And, and they can also be bullies to other birds at the feeder. Another blackbird that we have is the red-winged blackbird. So the male has that kind of namesake red wing occasionally with, or, or frequently in my experience, with a little bit of a yellow or a white border on it. Um, but otherwise it's just a, a jet black plumage. Some males can kind of be scalloped with brown, especially younger males. And the female is sort of this almost sparrow looking bird. Um, but notice we've got a pretty long dagger-like bill, but not quite as extreme as the grackle. And you can almost get intermediate forms that look like one or the other. So this is an adult male, and this is probably an adult female, but uh, like a young male that maybe doesn't have good genetics or hatched really late or whatever, may molt um, from looking like this as a juvenile to kind of an intermediate version. Or you might have a bird that's 
young but not quite on top of his game and so he looks kind of like this but has a lot of brown mixed in sometimes you'll even have one that looks more like a female with a red wing patch so they can be quite varied and then of course the brown-headed cowbird with the female being that drab clay color and the male being that iridescent kind of bluish green with a brown head and frequently all of these blackbirds will form groups together sometimes single species flocks but frequently they'll form mixed species blackbird flocks Talked about the American goldfinch uh, on a couple of our uh, bird of the month episodes recently, but it's worth just touching base about them again. We're going to see a lot of these this time of year. This is a breeding male, but a lot of these birds are starting to to become drab and look more like a female here. And of course, this is a juvenile, which there are still a lot of juveniles around. Um, notice the male has the black forehead, the, the breeding male has a black forehead, and the the non or this is a breeding female. Still quite brightly colored, but, but also not as bright as the male. Expect your birds to look somewhat intermediate between the juvenile form and the adult form as they enter the, the fall, uh, the non-breeding season. And these birds are highly migratory, but we have them all year round in Kentucky. And of course, we need to mention some of the warblers. Warblers are some of the favorites of bird watchers, and they're an extremely diverse group. We can see a wide variety here in Kentucky, like the common yellowthroat, the yellow warbler, and the yellow rumped warbler, just to name a few. And again, there are dozens of species of warblers we can find. The black and white warbler, the American red start, so this is a male American red start and a female here, and the black-throated green warbler. It's a really diverse group, so if you're really interested in looking at these really tiny little birds, they're very small, um, get out there this time of year. It's a great time of year to see these. I think the last group I have to discuss, at least on in terms of individual groups, are the vireos. And I don't want to spend too much time on them here, but it is worth mentioning we've got, for instance, the red-eyed vireo, which is kind of this greenish back and this dark gray and, and white markings on the face. The white-eyed vireo, which has this sort of yellow spectacles, a very stark white eye, and these kind of green and yellow and gray markings. And the blue-headed vireo, and these are by no means all the vireos we have, but a few of the common ones, uh, kind of has these white spectacles and this sort of bluish gray head. So again, I, I would encourage folks that are interested in learning more about our migrant birds to get out there and listen for these birds as they're on their migratory routes. Listen for those Swainson's thrush calls in the, in the, the early morning hours while it's still very dark and, and after dusk. And for that, sounding almost like a spring peeper. And the last thing I'd like to mention is kind of the end of migration as that approaches, watch for winter arrival. So for instance, golden crown kinglets start to become more abundant. Everybody's favorite, the dark-eyed junco, and, and my favorite winter uh, bird that we have, the white-throated sparrow. So keep an eye out for those birds that are going to migrate and spend the winter here, um, and tune in next time for our bird of the month. Well, you know, that was very interesting. Billy, and I'm there's some of those birds on there that I had never heard of before. So that was, that was really interesting to, to see and hear. Um, I, I know you, you all look at birds a little bit more than I have, but some of those, I was like, wow, I didn't know we had those. <laughs> yeah. It, it, the diversity is amazing, right? There's just so many species out there and really appreciate Dr. McNeil putting these segments together. You know, I've heard from some of our viewers, they've got some requests for Dr. McNeil. So we'll be okay. hitting him up with some additional thoughts, but a big thanks to him. Yeah, it is impressive. It's kind of the diversity we have and uh, you know they're so integrated with our forests and how we manage and care for our forests and that's something we talk a lot about uh, is you know how we can manage to try to help some of these populations so um it's good stuff i really appreciate dr mcnell for doing that also appreciate uh, mike lammerman for coming on give us kind of a gis intro um i think everybody will be downloading qgis before we know it and um, probably that out um and we'll have michael back on to kind of take us to maybe the next step on that but again appreciate both our guests for being on Thank you all for being with us today. Um, we're here every Wednesday at 11 o'clock, and we hope you'll let others know about From the Woods Today as well. Definitely. And, you know, everything we have, we post on fromthewoodstoday.com. So if you have any um, ideas, there's a survey on there. You know, like today, it was an idea taken from a from a guest. So um, we, we love any kind of ideas because, you know, we have shows. I think we only just don't miss two Wednesdays a year. So, um, <laughs> 
<laughs> so, or maybe three, but still we have a lot of show ideas and a lot of needs. And so um, if you have any ideas at all, let us know. Yeah, there's a good chance somebody else probably has the same questions or been dealing with the same thing. And that's the way we look at it as well. So um, yeah, we want to be um, servants to you all and trying to help you all be good stewards or, or, or take care of the woodlands that we've been entrusted with, um, however we can do that. Definitely. So uh, that's all we have for today. We will see you again next week at 11. Take care. Bye. Bye. Love the woods today.